Welcome back. So today, this is a special request video from one of my wonderful colleagues, Peter Blakeman, who has been uh, doing some work in charcuterie. And this is a session on process controls for meat processing. And we're going to hopefully work through all of the core process controls over time. But um, the first one I'm going to start with is Staphylococcus degree hour calculations. And this is important. If you are preparing ready-to-eat meat, you do need to integrate process controls into your production as part of the Safe Food for Canadians regulation. It is absolutely vital that you do not sell food that is going to cause potential harm to a consumer. And so having process controls is just a normal part of our production and being able to do staphylococcus degree hour calculations is not rocket science. So let's walk through how to do it. Um, at the end of this video, you'll be able to discuss the importance of staphylococcus control in ready-to-eat meats. You'll identify relevant regulatory guidance documents under the Safe Food for Canadians regulations for meat processing. We'll identify equipment relevant for process control monitoring. We'll calculate degree room, or green room or degree hour calculations on fermented meat to mitigate staphylococcus aureus growth and toxin formation. That's a lot of words, but in essence, we're going to uh, do some basic math, and it's not rocket science math, you will be able to do it if you can do basic addition and multiplication. And then we'll define the hold and test strategy for potentially impacted product. So just in case you think that staff may be growing in your product, how can you mitigate it so that you're not just throwing out all of your product? So let's let's jump in here. Well, staph aureus is one of the priority pathogens in Canadian meat processing, and it is not uncommon. I did a quick search through the Canadian Food Inspection Agency's recall database, and every year there are a good handful of staphylococcus recalls of ready-to-eat food products. And I said food products, not just meat, because uh, while ready-to-eat meats, charcuterie, cold cuts, um, deli slices, and so on, are prone to staphylococcus contamination, it can also show up in cheese or other dairy products. Staphylococcus really likes protein. And so cheese and other dairy products are potential as well. And so that's that's worth thinking about. Um, staphylococcus food poisoning is caused by a toxin. It's not that the bacteria infects you. It is the toxin that the bacteria are putting out as it, what's called an exometabolite. But um, the bacteria are munching away on the protein in that meat and they put out a toxin as, uh, as part of their byproducts of metabolism. And that toxin can cause nausea, vomiting, and stomach cramps, and sometimes cause diarrhea. And because it's a toxin, the onset can be quite quick. And this is a um, quote directly taken from the United States uh, Center for Disease Control, but the, the symptoms can develop within 30 minutes. And it can occur up to eight hours after eating the product. And in general, it's a, it's a short limiting um, illness, but at the same time, people feel absolutely horrible during that 24 hour period where they're impacted. So again, this is the sort of thing that can uh, cause a class one recall. A class one recall is where human health can be severely impacted because of the consumption of that product. And a class one recall is a quite a serious thing. So do not cause recalls. Um, I have had discussion recently about um, whether small businesses or independent businesses would ever be recalled, and absolutely they can. And uh, we were discussing in one of my classes uh, a recall of someone who was canning meat at their house in Prince Edward Island, and that became a national scale recall. So uh, this is an important thing to note, that just because you're a small operator doesn't mean that you do not need to be aware of these sorts of process controls. So what are the preventive controls for processed RTE meat? For it, with respect to staphylococcus, as we noted already, it's a highly stable heat-resistant toxin. So that heat resistance is important. We can't just cook it out. Some bacteria produce toxins, and through proper temperature control, we can cook the toxin out. Whereas in the case of staph aureus, we can't. Staph can grow between 15.6 to 60 degrees Celsius, and so we do need to be aware of that uh, temperature danger zone in particular. And... In this case, 15.6 is the bottom end of that. It tolerates neutral pH and it's found in uh, the neutral pHs that are found in most meats, and as I mentioned before, also in many dairy products. 
Once the pH of 5.6 is achieved in fermentation, so many meat products go through a fermentation cycle where lactic acid bacteria or other um, organisms um, metabolize the uh, glycogen or um, a little bit of the protein as well within that meat and create acid, which reduces the bacterial growth. We hit pH 5.3 and staph aureus growth is going to stop. So that's important. If we're doing a fermented meat product or we're acidifying using some other compound, uh, uh, some of the ready to eat meats are using what's called gulone or delta lactone. And that is a chemical that um, drops the pH slowly over time. But once we hit that pH 5.3, staph is not going to grow anymore. So that's important to track. So what do we need to do to track this? Well, we need to have a pH meter because we need to be able to track the pH in this product and figure out when it gets to pH 5.3. Now, um, in some cases, if you are in a meat processor, you may have an integrated uh, pH meter that's right within a programmable logic controller, and that's fantastic. But more often than not, small operators are going to have a handheld pH meter and these are devices that are getting quite affordable and we can find half decent pH meters that are in the $100 range that are easily uh, calibrated and have uh, two decimal points threshold. We want to make sure that we have good um, accuracy of that pH meter so that we can accurately note that we are at pH 5.30 actually. We also need to track the temperature in that fermentation green room and data loggers that track time and temperature are also becoming extremely affordable and extremely common. And in the case of uh, some of the growth or fermentation chambers that are commercially available, they sometimes are integrated in as a programmable logic controller or PLC module. But uh, in other cases, people will do add-ons and do their own data logging and tracking. But uh, having that uh, temperature chart is really useful along with that pH tracking. And so depending on how it's done, you may be having to go in on a manual basis every few hours to check the pH manually until you get below that pH 5.3. I'm not going to tell you how to use a pH meter. You should be following the standard operating procedures for each of these devices that you are obtaining, but I highly, highly recommend that you get one. So I have taken this information from the Safe Food for Canadians regulation guidance documents for meat processing. And so thank you to our good colleagues at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency for having this material available for you online. And I have shared the link in the description of this video for you so you can reference this document as well. So as we noted, Staph aureus likes to grow in that wonderful uh, temperature range between 15.6 and 60 degrees Celsius. And so as it's growing, other bacteria are growing, and they're dropping the pH. So what we need to calculate is what's called a degree hour. And so if we are tracking along and we have less than or fewer than 665 degree hours when the highest temperature is less than 33 degrees Celsius, or fewer than 555 degree hours when the highest fermentation is between the range of 33 and 37, or fewer than 500 degree hours when the highest fermentation is greater than 37 degrees Celsius. So we've got to figure out what on earth does this degree hour mean? Well, we're going to calculate that in a moment, but these are the cutoffs. These are the cutoffs at which when we're doing that tracking, that we know that the disposition of this product, if it's less than, if it's less than any of these values, when we've hit that max temperature, then we know that the product uh, based off of uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of hours of, data collection from CFIA, that those are going to be strongly repeatable. So first way that you can do this is just uh, look at a table. And honestly, <laughs> no math involved other than knowing how many hours did it take to get to that maximum or that, uh, that pH of 5.3 or less. And what was the maximum temperature in the room? So let's just imagine our fermentation took place at 30 degrees. Our pH has to drop below 5.3 in less than 46.2 hours. And so if you knew the product went in on, I don't know, uh, on a Monday at noon, you would have to pull it out before, let's say, 
24, 48 hours, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you would have to have it out at pH 5.3 before Wednesday at 10 o'clock in the morning. And it could be as simple as that sort of calculation. That is considered acceptable, provided that the fermentation is done at a constant temperature. Now, it does allow for come up time on the um, fermentation. So as you're loading your, your fermenter, uh, the first the first half hour, hour, depending on the efficiency of your fermenter, it may drop in temperature. But this, again, is the maximum temperature at which you're fermenting your product. So let's jump forward here. You can also do it mathematically. And math should not be something that you fear. Math should be something that you see as a useful tool to help you get where you need to be. So let's say we are fermenting in a room that is constant at 26 degrees Celsius, and it takes 55 hours for our pH to get to 5.3. Fantastic. So what we first do is we're going to calculate how many degrees will be above 15.6. So constant temperature, 26 degrees Celsius, and we calculated that it is 26 minus 15.6, so we've got 10.4 degrees Celsius degrees above that threshold. And it took us 55 hours to reach the pH of 5.3. So we're going to multiply 10.4 times 55 to give 572 degree hours. And if we go back to that chart that we had earlier, when our maximum temperature is less than 33, we can have 665 degree hours. And so because 572 is less than 665, we are good to go and we can release the product. So this product meets the guideline, it is less than the limit. Let's jump to another example. Oh, well, no, let's not. Let's, let's just remind ourselves, oh, could we do this by the table? Well, yes, we could. It was, what was the maximum temperature? It was maximum 26 degrees and on the table, we fermented for 55 hours, we could do this on the table. 55 is less than 63, and so the product is good to go. So, second example, constant temperature. Let's imagine the fermentation is occurring at 35 degrees and it takes 40 hours for the pH to get there. So first we're gonna figure out what is the difference. So 35 minus 15.6 gives 19.4 degrees difference and it took 40 hours. So 19.4 times 40 equals 776 degree hours. And going back to that table, if our max temperature is between 33 and 37, then we've got 555 degree hours max. And we have exceeded that by quite a bit here. So example two does not meet the guideline, its degree hours exceed the limit, and so we will need to hold and test this product. And that just means we can't release it for um, packaging, we can't release it for sale. At this point, we need to do additional testing to prove that this product is safe before we can release the product. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Now, oftentimes in these fermentation chambers, you will have either stepwise fermentations where you're, where you're moving the product from uh, different spaces during that fermentation process. In other cases, you'll have a um, changing rate and the data that's logged for that, you'll end up with a curve that isn't perfectly, here's the max temperature and that's the only temperature that we're dealing with. In the case of these changing temperature profiles, there are certain meat processors that are using VBA calculations in Excel that uh, they've got calculators, but in essence, you could do that area under the curve calculation for each of the different um, time periods. And then it goes back to what was that maximum, what, what was that maximum temperature that you hit? But you can also do some manual calculations. So I know this looks, this looks like a nightmare here, but let's walk through it piece by piece, because each of these pieces is just a mini calculation for the stepwise that this product went through. So let's say 35 hours, to get to pH 5.3. So let's say the first round of fermentation is 24 degrees for the first 10 hours, 30 degrees for the second 10 hours, and 35 degrees for the final 15 hours. 
And it's not uncommon for people to do these sorts of shifts because different fermentation organisms prefer different temperatures and, and uh, different artisans like to apply these different, different protocols. So first off, we're going to do the first calculation, 24 for 10 hours. So 24 degrees minus 15.6 is 8.4. 8.4 times 10 gives 84 degree hours. And we're going to keep a running tally here. Then the next calculation, so we had it at 30 degrees for 10 hours. So 30 minus 15.6 is 14.4. And 10 degree hour, or 10 hours in there, so it's cumulative. We haven't reached pH 5.3 yet. We're still just adding. So we're adding 14.4 uh, times 10 is 144. So we're going to add that 84 plus 144. Next, we've got it at 35 for 15 hours. So 35 minus 15.6 gives 19.4. And we've got 15 hours. So 35, or not 35, 19.4 times 15 gives 291. And we're going to sum all of those steps together. So 84 plus 144 plus 291 gives 519. And we have to go back to what was the highest temperature that we ran this product at, and that was 35 degrees Celsius. And so the corresponding degree hour limit was 50, or 555. And because 519 is less than 555, this product is okay. We can release it. Let's do one more. One last calculation here. So 38 hours to get to pH 5.3. So 24 at 10 hours, 30 for 10 hours, and 37 for the final 18. So again, same as before, we had 24 minus 15.6 gives 8.4 times 10, 84 degree hours here. And then we've got 30 degrees at the second step. So 30 degrees minus 15.6, 14.4 times 10, that cumulative time adds up here. So 144, so 14.4 times 10, 144. And step three, we have 37 minus 15.6 equals 21.4. 21.4 times that 18 hours at this time period, 21.4 times 18 is 385.2. Let's sum that all together at 613.2 degree hours. And the highest temperature in this case was 37 degrees. And so our corresponding degree hour limit is 555, and we have exceeded it. So again, we need to do Holden test on this product. So if we need to do Holden test, this is what we call a disposition of lot. We need to uh, identify what is the, dis the disposition of this batch of product, so we know that we're not going to release unsafe product to the consumer. So if we overstep our degree hours, we can first off test for Staph aureus and its enterotoxin. So this is not an, uh, it's, an, it's, it's not uncommon, but you'd want to send it out to a contract lab. And there's contract labs all over the place, um, all over Southern Ontario where we're located. And it's not that uncommon to ask for this sort of test. So the Staph aureus um, itself would be that uh, bacterial culture, but the enterotoxin would likely be an ELISA type test. You would also, because you have contamination, want to test for the other priority pathogens within RTE meats. And so that does include E. coli 157H7, includes Salmonella species, Clostridium botulinum, and Listeria monocytogenes. And you would do that testing not after the degree hour uh, completion. You would want to actually do it after the end of the drying period. And so you, if you did not meet your degree hours, you may need to have a segregated zone because of that potential of cross-contamination, you don't want to reintroduce that product into other wet product, but uh, the suggested recommended protocol is that you complete your fermentation and complete the drying of that product so that you have the finished product that goes for testing. Then if you have less than or fewer than 10 to the four, so 10 to the four would be 10, 100,000, 10,000, Staph aureus per gram, and no enterotoxin, no other pathogens, then you can sell that product, but it has to be a refrigerated product. If you have greater than 10 to the 4 or 10,000 Staph aureus per gram and no enterotoxin and other pathogens, then you have to convert it to a quick product. If you have 
any enterotoxin, that product has to be um, condemned. And so it has to be thrown out. You, If there's enterotoxin, that's the stuff that causes the nausea, the vomiting, the diarrhea, the, the, the misery of this product. And so enterotoxin there at all has to be, it has to be condemned product. So as I mentioned before, CFIA and FSS, FSS is our American counterparts. They do have uh, routinely, we see class one recalls in our tea meat, in charcuterie, in dairy products, cream-based dessert fillings, and icings in particular for staph aureus. Because again, staph aureus likes to eat protein. Protein is delicious though. And uh, I do hope that you are not deterred from wanting to participate in meat processing. You just know that the math is there and it's not, it's not insurmountable. It's actually not difficult once you wrap your head around it. And so I really hope that this has dispelled a lot of the uh, misconceptions around doing staph aureus testing. It's, it, it really just comes down to some basic uh, multiplication and addition. And I think all of you are quite capable of doing that now that we've walked through this together. So have fun making fermented meat and we'll see you in the next video. And we'll talk about some more of these priority pathogens and appropriate process controls. Take care and we'll talk to you soon.